So um, I've got way too much material, and I'm going to try and zip through certain things and, and uh, make sure that we hit on the juicy bits uh, before we break for uh, Q&A. So uh, this is, this is uh, my CV on one slide. And uh, the only parts of it that I'm going to be talking about uh, today are uh, photosynth and a little bit about Bing Maps and Bing Mobile and a little bit about augmented reality. Uh, so I'll, I'll focus on the, the jaw-dropping bits. Um, these, are, these are my URLs that I could click on if, uh, if, if I mess up and have to go back. Uh, okay, so I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about the relationship between graphics and computer vision. Oops. <laughs> So um, the picture that you're seeing here is, is uh, um, actually, I, I think this is from Alberti, but I'm not positive. It's, it's an early modern picture of the way perspective works. And uh, perspective is the foundation of, of computer graphics. And the idea behind computer graphics is that you take a three-dimensional world or environment and you create a two-dimensional scene or representation of it. And, and so you, you have a known 3D world and you propose a camera position. And from that camera position, you do a little bit of simple math and all those three-dimensional points map to the two-dimensional surface, and that creates the image. And this is, uh, this is the foundation for, for computer graphics, which you know, really came of age in the, in the 90s with all these computer graphics movies and things, but I, in, in many ways came of age earlier, came of age in the 70s. And computer vision is the inverse problem to computer graphics. So inverse problem meaning um, it tries to go from the 2D scene back to the 3D. And that's a much harder problem. There's, there's always this situation with forward problems and inverse problems. A forward problem is speech synthesis, and the inverse problem to that is speech recognition. Right? So you go from, from, the, um, from the known into the ambiguous, and the inverse problem is to go from the ambiguous back to the known. Or optical character recognition is another example. It's easy to print characters. right? You have the ASCII or the textual representation. You create an image of the letters. That's easy. But going from the image of the letters back to the text, that's hard. And in the same way, going from the two-dimensional image back to the three-dimensional scene is very hard. And this is something that our, our eyes and our brains naturally do. Right? We have these two two-dimensional versions of the world around us and printed on both retinas whenever we look at the world around us. And, and uh, computer vision is about trying to teach computers to do the same thing. So uh, this, was, this is a, a screenshot from the very first demo of Photosynth that we did back in 2006. And um, this was that collaboration with the University of Washington. Um, what this is, is a, a, a crude or rudimentary model of Notre Dame Cathedral as points, as a cloud of points, a point cloud, we call it. And those orange diamonds scattered all over the ground are the positions of the cameras of many, many people who took photos of Notre Dame Cathedral and posted those photos on Flickr. So this algorithm begins with nothing but those photos, 500 or so photos of Notre Dame Cathedral. And, um, and from those, it reconstructs the three-dimensional cathedral, and it also reconstructs where all of the cameras were, which, which way they were pointing. And you, you have to do one to do the other. You have, you have to do those problems together. They're coupled problems. You can't do one and not the other. Um, so that was, that was um, the jaw-dropping thing in, in 2007, um, 3D from 2D images. And this got very different reactions from people uh, inside and outside the, the, uh, the computer science field of computer vision. Um, from inside the computer vision field, it was seen as kind of clever trick, a clever hack. And from outside, it was seen as, as amazing and, and something that nobody knew we could do. The field of computer vision has been around for, for decades, uh, really for as long as the field of computer graphics has been around. And um, these techniques have been known for, for a while, although they're, they're, it's the, uh, the usual thing with technology, the series of incremental improvements that make something that starts off very, very hard finally become doable. Uh, what, what we didn't tell anybody when we did these first demos with Notre Dame is that that, f that early collaboration with the University of Washington to do these 500 photos took two weeks of compute time on a cluster of hundreds of, of cores, hundreds of computers. So this was a very, very computationally intensive task. And by the time we released Photosynth uh, to the public um, two years later, in, in August of 2008, uh, we, had, we had gotten this to the point where you could do it on a, on a laptop like this with those couple of hundred photos. And the computer vision work happens on the laptop in less time, typically, than it takes just to upload all of those images to the server. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's technology, and that's, that's, how, that's how it always goes. Right? Um, so it has a long history. It's the inverse problem. I'll give you a very, very brief sketch of how it works. 
and uh, this is just for the, the geekiest among us. So um, you start off with, with, with all the pictures, and you do something called feature extraction. And what that means is that you look for, um, let me skip ahead and show you features. Those boxes, I I'm not sure if you can see them clearly, but um, these, are, these are a bunch of colored boxes in different orientations and different sizes on one image of the space shuttle. And here's another image of the space shuttle and more boxes. Okay, so these features are spots in the image where something, where there's some feature, something is happening, something sort of corner-like. An edge is no good because you can't, it, it, it has a kind of loose degree of freedom, but a corner is good. So what you're looking for are cornerish sorts of things. And uh, you're trying to describe them uh, using a series of numbers, uh, which is called a descriptor. And the goal with that series of numbers is that that descriptor should be very similar when you look at the same feature in the three-dimensional world from two different points of view, maybe with different cameras. Maybe one of them is with a cheap cell phone camera and one of them is with a, with a fancy SLR camera. And they're from slightly different angles and different contrasts and, um, and different conditions, maybe even different days. So they should be similar when the thing that they're looking at is the same thing in the world. But they should be different when they're different things in the world. And so that's the problem of making descriptors in a, in a nutshell. And so what you do when, you, when you've identified all these descriptors in, in, this, in these 500 different images is you just do a game of matching up. Uh, the computer does a sort of matching where it says, this, this point over here in this image we believe is the same thing in 3D as that, that one over there in that image. You can't change your point of view too much or the descriptors drift too far apart. So you have to kind of stitch it together. Imagine it like a giant cat's cradle with strings connecting those features in different photos that correspond to that same corner of that same window in different people's photos. Right, so once you've done that matching, then the rest of it is easy. Um, the rest of it is the 3D reconstruction problem. And this is really just a matter of taking the, the perspective transform, which says if, it, you know, if I know something in 3D and I know the camera position, then I know where it ought to end up on the imaging plane and uh, define what's called an energy function out of that, which is the sum of all the points in 3D. When I project them back onto all the camera positions that I've got, I have a position where they ought to belong, and I have a position where they were actually observed. So imagine a line segment on every image drawn from where they ought to occur to where I actually observed them. Once I've solved the problem of moving around all the cameras in 3D and moving around all the points in 3D, then those line segments will all shrink to zero. Right, so this is uh, just a function in a very, very high dimensional space. The number of dimensions is seven times the number of cameras, x, y, z, theta, phi, omega, focal length, plus three times the number of points in 3D. And so that's, you know, if you have a thousand points and ten cameras, I, I'm actually not very good at doing math in my free time. <laughs> anyway, so it's a very high dimensional space, and you've defined this energy, and all you have to do is work your way downhill in that energy landscape. And what uh, working your way downhill means is moving around the points in 3D and moving around the cameras until the whole thing drops close to zero and then you're done. And then you've got this. So you start off with all the cameras in the same spot and all the points in 3D kind of on a plane, and then you just keep moving them around until you get to this spot. Easy. All right, so that's, that's basic computer vision. And um, I'll, I'll give you a quick demo of Photosynth, of what we, of what we actually uh, created out of this. So we made a, we made a website uh, called photosynth.net, and we got the .com later, although we have to pay more money for that one. <laughs> and um, and this, is a, uh, this is a synth that I took of our ex-nanny, Jesse, so uh, our, our au pair Ilse, her, her successors, successors, successors here tonight. And, um, this, is, this is Jesse. And... Um, this is the 2D view of all the pictures that I took of Jesse sitting on this particular dock in, um, in New England a couple of years ago. And I just took these with a normal camera. And uh, while it was uploading, uh, this computer vision problem was being solved. And what you end up with is, um, I'm gonna try and stand in the spot where the camera can actually see the screen and me at the same time. What you end up with is um, a reconstruction of Jesse in 3D uh, actually, if I, if I hit P, you can see the, the point cloud for Jesse. All right, so this is a 3D reconstruction of Jesse from all of those pictures. And you can actually see, if you look closely, she looks a little bit like a Greek or like, a, like, a, like an Indian uh, goddess with multiple arms or whatever because, because she's not staying totally still as I take all of these photos. Um, but uh, that, so that's the photos and the point cloud superimposed on top of each other. That's both of them at the same time. And you know, then you just navigate around all of these photos and they've all been connected in 3D. You can see these quads, these rectangles. I can click on one of those and get, you know, this is just normal 
photography with a, with a $100 camera, uh, you could really get a lot of pixels out of these things, more than, more than many people appreciate. Um, let's see. We're on a slightly slow network, so this, this, this might take a while to resolve. But, um, <laughs> that might be more than you actually want to see. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, in any case, so that's all, that's all these pictures of Jesse reconstructed into a three-dimensional Jesse. Right, so it, it, it doesn't generally work that well for people because they don't have a lot of features, but Jesse had a lot of tattoos, and um, so it worked, it worked for her. And she had lots of freckles, so that helped too. Okay, so, um, so this is the same thing. This point cloud of Notre Dame is the same thing as the point cloud of Jesse and her freckles and tattoos. And those are the original, the original images. So um, when we first did this back in 2008, we were really super excited because there are so many photos of the world out there on the internet, right? And there was this fantasy that, that, uh, that I was certainly harboring and, and the, our collaborators at UW were also harboring that maybe if you go out and mine all of the photos on the internet, you'll come out with a three-dimensional reconstruction of the whole world that everybody's been unwittingly creating as they go around with their cameras. And it's just, it'll be like this wonderful emergent phenomenon where everybody is actually like an eyeball in a super organism and, and so on. Um, of course. <laughs> Uh, but it didn't quite work that way. And, and this, uh, this picture illustrates why. So this is, a, um, this is a, um, a kind of complicated graphic, but every one of these bubbles represents a photo uh, from, a, a photo, uh, from a photo sharing or uploading company called uh, SmugMug that we did some work with. Um, yeah, SmugMug is great. And uh, these, are, these are pictures of Tha Prom, which is one of the temples in the Angkor Wat complex in Cambodia. And uh, so, you know, it's kind of out of the way place, but not too out of the way. Lots of tourists go there. And, uh, you know, we, we found quite a few photos of Tapram on, on Smugmug. And what we've done is draw a line between every, t every pair of photos that connects. And by connect, we mean they share some features in 3D. They see something in common. And what you find is that, you know, it doesn't look like everything connects to everything and you, you have this nice geometric reconstruction of the temple. You don't. Instead, what you have is these two extremely hot spots. Okay, so that big clump that big hairball over there and another big hairball over there. And Tapram is a very small temple. You have just enough photos to connect around the front over here and to connect around the back, but barely. And Tapram is a very simple temple compared to the main Angkor Wat complex. So uh, it turns out those clumps correspond to this picture, which is picturesque because there's a fig tree growing in just the right way. And this picture, and, and I think this one was famous because of uh, Lara Croft Tomb Raider. Uh, there was a, like a, a shot that, you know, so. So many, everybody takes the same damn picture. And you know, you just, you can, you can walk through all those pictures, just one face, another face, another face, another face in the same exact spot. Not very many people are gonna systematically go around the temple and photograph it from all the points of view that it would require to actually reconstruct the temple in 3D. So when people take snaps, they're not taking the kind of pictures that let you really do uh, serious 3D reconstruction of the world. That was kind of the, the lesson. Um, now, uh, that was what inspired us to release Photosynth as a Flickr-like or a SmugMug-like service in which people could upload their pictures. They could, they could uh, take, you know, a hundred of their own pictures of Taprom um, in a kind of synthy way, meaning don't just take, you know, a hundred pictures from the same, the same spot, but walk around the temple, go inside, go through, take those odd shots that you'd never take in order to put up on a, on a photo sharing site and synth them. We called it, you know, Photosynthing. It was very clever. It wasn't my name. Um, and, uh, and, you'll, and you'll create your own 3D reconstruction of that thing. And we, we were thinking maybe we could convince people to think about this as a new medium, not just, a, not just a photo, not a video, but some other thing, a synth. And a lot of people used it. So we, we had, we had um, and there are still quite a few people using it. Uh, so this was uh, after a, just a, a few days, after maybe a week, we had dozens of synths of Notre Dame Cathedral. And some of them had hundreds of photos um, like, you know, this one had 404 photos and was 99% synthy, meaning 99% connected. And this one person made a better reconstruction of Notre Dame Cathedral than all of Flickr did. Because his photos look like this, you know, they're, they're just systematic and he, you know, he walks across the entire facade of the cathedral and he goes around the corner and so on. And so you get this beautiful point cloud of Notre Dame Cathedral. Uh, so that's the difference between uh, just vacation snaps and people going in systematically trying to capture the world in 3D using their cameras. Uh, and and that, was, that was an interesting lesson. Many, many people began doing, f doing interesting things, like began they began taking synths from the air. Some of them began 
putting cameras up in, in unmanned aerial vehicles and hot air balloons and kites and all kinds of crazy stuff and taking photos from the air and making synths of large structures. And um, uh, in fact, at some point, more than 10% of our synths were aerial. There was a whole kind of little mini movement that grew up around this. And some of these are pretty amazing. Like this is, uh, this is the, uh, the Primosten Peninsula on Croatia. And this was the, the Bing maps. Uh, actually, at the time, it was called live maps. Uh, data on Primosten. You can see it's pretty lousy. Like the roads don't even fall inside the, you know, the outlines. Actually, we've gotten a little better here. But um, this is the point cloud of somebody's aerial synth of the Primosten Peninsula. It has whole, you know, islands that that weren't on the map, and uh, it's it's it was all done with a camera in a in a plane, and um, you know he, this this guy took photos of people's backyards and so on that there's no way we'd be able to take officially. Um, so so this was like a, a crowd, you know crowdsourced aerial primo sten that that b belonged on the map, and uh, we began experimenting with what kind of reconstructions we could do if we applied more computing power to. Um, to these kinds of synths, and uh, these are the sorts of things that we were able to make. This is um, somebody else's aerial synth of Kelvin Grove Museum in Scotland, and this is just a point cloud. Okay, so somebody did it with a helicopter. That's not even a real 3D model. It's just a point cloud like the, like the Notre Dame one, and the detail is, is just um, kind of amazing. Right? This is much higher detail than what you can get on you know, Google Earth or, or virtual Earth or whatever. And it's just one person kind of doing it with, a, with an ordinary camera and reconstructing with these kind of algorithms. Or, or here's, here's, another, here's another example. Um, this is the Empire State Building in New York. In fact, it's not just the Empire State Building. This one helicopter flight generated enough points to reconstruct a large part of um, lower Manhattan. Um, so again, that's just points. Uh, they're just so thick that, that they, they look solid. Um, so amazing amounts of, of, of data in this crowdsourced aerial stuff. So this was really pretty thought-provoking. Um, oops, where's my slide? Okay. Um, so I'll skip this stuff. This is kind of some obvious things about the relationships between Superman, Spider-Man, and Clark Kent and Sherlock Holmes. Um, we... We do have, so one of the nice things about, about uh, Bing Maps and what we did um, as, as part of, uh, this, was, this happened before my time, before I joined Bing Maps, um, or before I joined Virtual Earth. Uh, Microsoft acquired a, a company called Vexel that, that makes these astonishing million dollar cameras. Um, and just for, for scale, that's the size of these cameras, right? So they're as big as a, as big as a dude. And um, you mount them in the bottom of planes and they fly over, um, they fly over different places in the world. And basically, you can make a synth out of, out of the world from overhead, and you can cover very large areas. We're actually doing a project with one of these cameras right now that's the, by far the most extensive aerial mapping project ever undertaken uh, and uh, at, at a very, very small fraction of the cost that the government uh, took to do the same exact thing just a few years ago. Um, but um, this is, of course, these things are highly regulated. And uh, you know, the advantage of them is that, they're, is that they're a kind of, they form a kind of trellis once you've done that, then you can connect all of this other stuff to it. And so if you think about the connections between photos as the foundation for what something like Photosynth can do, you can think about this kind of mass scan of the Earth as being a trellis and then grape, you know, it, it gets covered like an arbor with, with grapes and vines and things that are people's own stuff that binds and attaches to that and becomes the organic part of it. And that, that really was the vision that we were trying to, we were trying to push. You know, this, this aerial stuff, it's, it's fine, but it's not really definitive. It's not up to date. You know, it starts aging the moment you capture it. It's not that detailed. It's just enough to form a trellis on which you can get a rich organic growth. That's the way we imagined it happening. Um, and uh, we did the same thing with the street side. So um, we, we began to, um, and Google was doing this um, a couple of years earlier, although I have to point out that um, Virtual Earth actually uh, prototyped this well before uh, Google did. But they never took it anywhere. It's a typical Microsoft. They're like they did it first, but then they, well, oh yeah, research project. And then Google went and spent a, you know a billion dollars on it. But anyway, this is where you go down the street and you take panoramic images off the top of a car, and you um, and you make what you know what Google calls street view and what we call uh, street side, because it's different. Um, <laughs> um, and um, here's what that. Here, but we think we think ours looks kind of cooler. Uh, so I'll I'll try and um, pull it up, although. Um, Although I can't really guarantee that it's going to work all that well with our bandwidth here, so we'll we'll give it a go. 
Um, so this is the Maps Explorer site, which isn't the main uh, photosynth. Wi oh sorry, isn't the main map site, but um, one where we do a lot of our playing around and experimenting. Uh, you know, this is this, uh, this is going to be a little bit painful, I'm afraid. Um, we're kind of we're, we're we're trying to decide between this Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi from Easy Street across the street, and they're both <laughs> they're both <laughs> not really doing the trick for us. Uh, okay, I, uh, we might have to we might have to forego the the live demo of this thing. It's it's a pity because it's pretty cool. But uh, what we what we did with it is um, it's not just pictures. It's not just these photos that that uh, these panoramic photos that you take down the street. We we do something photosynth like with them and reconstruct the three D of the facades of the street. And we make something that looks a little bit like so. This is the raw data. We get these kind of panoramic images every couple of meters. And we can reconstruct something that we called at the time Potemkin Village geometry, meaning simple geometry that just represents the facades of the streets. And then you can do a, a fun trick, which is to take those panoramas and project them. Imagine that, that those panoramas are in the inside faces of a cube. And you put those cubes where the cameras actually were in the street, and you shine light from the center of that cube. Imagine it's made of cellular, and you shine light from the inside and project it onto that Potemkin Village geometry. You get something. So this is, this is a, a real rendering of that. Uh, so that's the cube. And this is before the cube had a top or a bottom. And you're kind of shining light through it and projecting it onto that simple U-shaped geometry on the street. So notice, for example, that those guys get folded in half, right? Because we don't have geometry for them. We're doing a simple geometry here. They're getting kind of painted onto the walls and, and floor. And this is what that looks like from above. Um, there's a cube right over here. And you can see it by its, by its hexagonal footprint because you can't see it, can't see it down through the car. And uh, I'm just going to walk down. This is one cube after another projected onto that simplified geometry. So this is kind of a strange view. From here it looks really distorted, um, especially as you get far away from the cube. Um, notice, notice, for example, over here you can see this doorway that looks kind of eyes of Dorian grayish, right? It sort of follows you around. Um, but the thing is that if you look at this from the point of view of the cube itself, then it looks completely undistorted. Because um, this is just kind of a, a, a rule of geometry. When you project onto a surface, but you move your eye to right where the projector is, you can't tell the shape of the surface anymore. You can only tell the shape of the surface when you move your eye away from that point of projection. So we use this trick, and as you move down the street, you're changing projectors. You're sort of crossfading from one projector to the other as you move smoothly, and that gives you a very powerful illusion of 3D, uh, even though it's the, the 3D part is very simple. And it's mostly based on these images. So it's kind of a hybrid approach. And what that lets you do is all kinds of fun augmented reality applications. But anyway, so that's the kind of camera that we used. Um, and it was made by the same company that made the, the aerial camera by Vexel. Looks a bit Darth Vader-ish, um, um, black on top of the van. And uh, we, we, did, we did some playing around with small versions of this that you could wear as a backpack. Um, and this is very stylish. Um, and you can, you know, you can take it on a Vespa or whatever. And uh, you can take it on a bicycle, <laughs> and um, and and we we just we've actually just released a, a, a really a really cool uh, panoramic app for the iPhone as well. We released it two weeks ago, and uh, with that you can use your iPhone to take panoramas uh, anywhere. And um, we've we've been super pleased by the reception of that app. It's it's gotten two million downloads in the first two weeks and five stars uh, rating, and people are s people are saying it's the best thing since sliced bread, which I totally agree with. Um, and uh, people have been taking these amazing, so it's really just single panoramas. That's not, you know, you, you have to take one at a time when you're using your phone. But, um, you know, people have been contributing pretty amazing things. Um, in fact, a lot of, uh, let's see. Uh, no, I'm not going to roll the video and play this stuff. We, we, don't, we don't have enough time. I'm already running over. But uh, anyway, so lots and lots of people are starting to upload these panoramas. Of course, you can just take them the way you'd take an ordinary photo and keep it only for yourself or you can share it only with your friends. But one of the things that we're trying to encourage is for people to share it with the world, to share their, their stuff with the world, the way many people do on, on Flickr and on YouTube and elsewhere. And uh, furthermore, to do it uh, under Creative Commons, which is this, this wonderful uh, legal structure. Um, and uh, under Creative Commons, uh, this is pioneered by Larry Lessig. Um, and under that kind of legal structure, instead of holding the copyright, you release it to be used and remixed in any way by the public um, with attribution. So you, it always attributes back to you. You still own it, but you allow it to be remixed in any way. And we, we think this is really a very important way to think about the evolution of digital rights of media. Uh, I mean, most of us are not, are not professional 
artists or photographers who make our living from our pictures, right? So either it's for yourself and your friends, or if you're gonna share it, you might as well allow others to use it however they will without having to get in touch with you and you know, negotiate, you know, because they, they won't, right? So, um, so that's, that's the way we've been trying to think about these things, about a, as a kind of commons where you throw all of these things into the pot and you get this sum that's much greater than the parts from all of those bits and pieces, all those photos, all those panoramas, all those things that people submit. And uh, so the last, I'll, I'll just finish up um, briefly with the project that, that we're really engaged in heavily right now, which is called Read Write World. And uh, we, we just launched this a couple of weeks ago, just a couple of days after that, uh, after that, that iPhone app for making uh, panoramas. The idea behind Read Write World is that uh, we, we have an index, uh, and it, it's a little bit like the index of the web that started web searching and web crawling. Uh, you know, it started Alta Vista and then, and then uh, you know, Yahoo and Google and all of those companies for textual documents. But this is, mo this is designed for media, for images especially, and for video. And it allows all of those things to really link together and create that kind of commons, which is a digital representation of the world that's alluded to by all of these things. Um, and we, we, ha we threw up some, some very preliminary stuff. It's based on um, some early experiments that we did last year involving uh, photos from Flickr and connections between those photos from Flickr and our street side imagery in Seattle. So each, each blue dot on this map represents a Flickr photo that we, we did in, in that very earliest experiment connected visually to, um, to Seattle. And um, I, I wish now that I had kept the still image to show you what that looks like because um, without, without um, working live internet, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna be able to show you the real thing, but it's pretty amazing. You end up with, we'll skip these geeky slides, but you end up with a, a Flickr picture sort of overlaid on top of that street side imagery and connected to it. And of course, people are taking pictures all the time, everywhere. So if you imagine, you know, it's, Microsoft doesn't own any of that stuff. The people who created those media own it. But by indexing it all, what we're able to do is make something that looks sort of like the bulletin board at Berkeley, where you know, anybody who, who puts something up, it pastes on top of what was there before. And you end up with this pastiche that represents the most current rendition or the most current representation of the world at that particular place. Think about it a little bit like, like Twitter or like tweeting uh, images or video or media that represent a place at a particular time, maybe connected with a particular event. Uh, and so we're, we're pretty excited by that, that idea, that, that, that kind of collective world idea. Uh, I'll give you a, one, one last uh, demonstration uh, that hints a little bit at, at uh, what, we're, what we're doing here. So this is, um, this is a, a tilted view of the map and um, it, it, it's querying for media that have been connected here, but of course because our, our bandwidth is not gonna be too good, we're, we're not gonna get a whole lot of that. But we've put our street side on this map too. And so you can see these kind of continuous transitions down from the map to um, these stitched, horizontally stitched images of the street. And many of you will recognize this, of course, this is downtown uh, near the Smith Tower. Uh, what we can also do is when we find connections between, between visual media, we can um, generate video to create transitions between those, those media. So, um, I don't, I don't know now whether I successfully clicked on Trabant or not. Here we go. Um, so this is, a, this is an automatically generated video transition from the outside uh, into the inside. And, and this, this is a panorama inside Trabant uh, taken uh, just, you know, it's, it, this, one, this particular one wasn't taken with the iPhone app, but it could have been. And, um, you know, and then here's another pano taken in the rear of the cafe and again, automatically generated video linking that front pano with the back pano. And um, you know, we, can, we can go back, let's go back to the front. And uh, we also did, we also did a, a little um, close up mini panel of, of this painting over here. And so uh, you know, these could have been taken by different people. At, in fact, they were taken by different people at different times and they all just wire up. They just connect in this index, allowing you to walk on that graph of media that are all connected through space and through, through visual relationships. Uh, and you know, this, so this particular one, for example, uh, you know, it's copyright by Lauren Aldrich, who is the, the, uh, the artist of this particular piece. And uh, this panorama is copyright by, uh, by David Getty um, via Photosynth. So it's, it's a mixture, it's a very heterogeneous mixture of different sorts of media. None of it is actually owned by Microsoft per se, but what we've done is indexed and connected it all together into something that we hope is 
greater than the sum of the parts and enables all sorts of really interesting things to happen that couldn't have happened with all of these media when they're disconnected. So our next step is to think about what we can do, of course, beyond just the simple media. We're interested in real-time streams. We're interested in semantics. We're interested in the sorts of applications that you can make with a phone when, when it's out there in the world with you, when you're augmented in some sense by the phone, and it's able to connect to all of that richness of information that's connected with that spot in the world at that particular time. So uh, I, I think that's probably a good place to end. I guess we, now we, we do now our, our, our five minute break and then we uh, move on to Q&A, right? I did want to show off very quickly. We've got enough, just enough connectivity to show this transition from aerial imagery. So this is this is aerial imagery at 45 degrees, and if I click on the little dude, I get a blue outline showing uh, where we've driven the streets. This is in, in Manhattan, and if you click someplace, then you get this this kind of elegant transition down to the street, and that that was the Potemkin Village geometry that you were seeing during that transition. So you know here we're in we're in a panoramic photo. Um, and if I, and notice, notice that the, the, that disk is showing that simplified geometry. It's showing you the corners between the ground and the, and the buildings. If I click, then I get that transition mediated by that geometry that I was describing in, in that series of images. So you don't, you don't see as many of the distortions when you keep the point of view uh, aligned with the images. But you see here, it, it was faking it for a while while we were downloading the next panorama. So that, that's all I wanted to show. Um, and we could do the Flickr imagery on top and so on, but let's not. Let's take, let's take questions. Okay, great. So we'll get started with the questions, and um, I imagine there'll be a lot all at once, so please be patient. We'll get to you as quickly as possible. I'm a land surveyor, and I'm kind of interested in how right. I don't own or work with the um, scanning devices that are out fairly prevalent now, but this sounds so similar that I'm wondering how you how you peg it down to real world, world coordinates and how it would overlay with people that are actually using the scan cloud um, applications. Yeah, so those are fantastic questions. And that, so you're, you're obviously in, you know, you're in the industry, you know a lot of, this, a lot of the technical stuff here. The, um, so to answer your first question, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the surveying, so a lot of the historical work that's been done along these lines uses LIDAR, which is, uh, which is this kind of laser range scanning type technology. Uh, a lot of what we do is vision-based, meaning it just uses pictures. And um, the technology for, for doing com computer vision-based uh, reconstruction just using pictures has now gotten to the point where we don't think uh, LIDAR is, is needed anymore. Uh, you can get all the detail that you can from LIDAR from, from just ordinary pictures and from matching. Uh, now, the other thing you're asking about is what are, what are called ground control points, right, which are when you have a known position in the world you know, this is exactly where this particular mark on the ground is. How do I connect that to this in order to make it not float so that it's grounded? And you need fewer and fewer of those as the accuracy of the reconstruction grows. When the reconstruction is all kind of floppy, you need lots of ground control points in order to nail it down. It's like a carpet that needs to be nailed down with carpet tacks. These techniques are so good now that uh, with this large scanning project that I referred to earlier, the UltraCam G with Digital Globe, you know, it, the number of ground control points we're using to lock it to the surface of the earth is so small, and you still just get a beautiful reconstruction. Uh, we didn't, so that's done without ground control points at all. That's done purely using these computer vision techniques. You, you, you have a, a known, that one of the slides I skipped was a distribution of errors of how far away the geoposition was in the photo from where it actually ended up. As long as you, you have it within a couple of hundred meters, that's, that's still a small enough area to just scan and just you know, look for where it, where it fits. It's like a Where's Waldo kind of exercise. And the computer just does it all for you. Hi, Blaze. Um, I'm a big fan of your work, and I want to thank you for coming to speak uh, here tonight. Um, so in your talk, you sort of alluded to some really cool uh, future augmented reality mobile apps that we should see coming out. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on what you envision for the future in that space and what we can expect from your team in, in the sure. next couple of years. Thank you. Well, um, so I have to be a little bit careful about, you know, really talking in detail about what we're, what we're doing that we haven't announced yet. But uh, if, if you know about my work, you probably have read William Gibson's books. Right, um, it's sort of a, a, what are these things called? Like um, uh, 
the last three, the last three that he wrote with um, with the Sonic Youth chick, whatever. Like his three books basically tell the whole story <laughs> of you know what you can do with augmented reality applications. It, it goes further as well, but I mean, the basic idea is that any time you can connect information, semantics, actions, applications to the real world in any way, then once you have the ability to um, to make that to form that connection in real time, not only not only you know do it later at your computer, but do it in real time with a, with a portable device. Uh, it's the the whole world just changes. You're sort of in Terminator mode or whatever. And um, and we we are not that, that, that sounded worse than it actually was. We we are actually at that at that point. One of the things that we released uh, two weeks ago with Read Write World is a web service that allows you to just plug in a URL for an image and a guess at where it is within you know 100 meters or 200 meters. Uh, it, that in the form of a geotag on that image. And within seconds, it'll come back with, here's the match, and here's the exact position. So we're, we're, we're very, very close to real time now, at being able to make those, that kind of locking happen. And if you think about augmented reality, strong augmented reality, I don't mean the lame kind of augmented reality that just uses the, the compass and the GPS to say roughly stuff is in that direction. I mean the real kind where the camera or the viewfinder has stuff attached to it, right? You need two things to make that happen. One of them is real-time tracking. And real-time tracking is exactly what we've got in the, in the iPhone Panorama app, right? So we can track points and features visually in real-time. And the other thing you need is that, is that keyframe operation that lets you, with a particular image, lock it to the world. That's kind of like the ground control point equivalent. And we've got both now. It's very cool technology, but can you talk a little bit about the privacy issues? I mean, this sure. seems fairly huge, invasive privacy. Oh, wait, wait. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm extremely interested in these, in these privacy issues. Actually, the, um, there's a wonderful talk that I would encourage you all to have a look at that uh, Eli Parizer uh, gave at TED this past year and has just posted online today uh, about, about privacy and profiling via online services. It talks about Facebook and about Google both. Um, so, I mean, I think these are extremely important issues. Um, there are two places where privacy comes in, I think, with what, with what we're doing here. One of them is when we do our collection, you know, the street side photography, the aerial photography, are we invading people's privacy when we do that? And uh, as you probably know, Google has run into some trouble in Germany, for example, along those lines. And when Google first drove uh, in Tokyo, they didn't have the height of the camera set correctly, and they, they were seeing over the fences. And there was actually regulation about how high the camera could be before seeing into backyards and so on. And they had to redrive it. Um, so you can run afoul of privacy by doing that. But I think that issue has 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 actually been totally overblown in the sense that the amount of private anything that you see in those street side or street view or aerial photos, it's pretty limited because ultimately the, re the resolution is not that high. It's done very infrequently and it's all done in totally public spaces. Uh, so it's, I mean, when you compare that to what you find when you just explore a site like Flickr, right, which just consists of you know, things that people do to each other, if you like, right, it's, it's nothing. So the, you know, there are two interesting questions that arise there. The first is when you are photographing the world, when you're creating media, you know, what are, what, what's the onus on you to, to protect or to think about the privacy of the people that you're taking images of? And I think that's just one of those big you know, unresolved societal questions that we haven't really come to grips with and in many ways is independent of all of the stuff that we're doing. What we're doing is forming connections between media, but we're not generating, you know, I mean th that's media that's already, that's already there. What we're doing is, is indexing. So uh, the next question is, does the indexing do something beyond just, you know, that sea of unconnected images that were already there? And I think this is exactly parallel to what happened when we started, you know, when, when Google began doing a really good job of indexing the web. Right? People had private diaries and things up there on the web, and they thought, ah, you know, it's the web, you know, it's a sea of web pages, nobody will find this thing, it's okay if I write all about my sex life on this thing and nobody's gonna find it, right? And uh, the moment it's indexed properly, of course, you just do a search and it's there. And people um, realized that that was public the whole time. Anybody could type in the URL and see that thing. And in that sense, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that 
when Google indexed the web so well like that, they were doing anything privacy violating. The, the stuff was all there already. What they were doing was a public service of you know making it searchable in the way that a, a library is searchable by a cloud platform. And um, uh, so I, I see that as very parallel, what we're doing with DMAs. I'm not trying to belittle those privacy issues. I think they're really serious. But I, I don't think that the indexing in itself um, changes the fundamental nature of that challenge that we have to address as a society. I, I hope that I hope that makes some sense. Oh, oh okay. Because my question is related to your question, but it has to do about eco uh, economic interest. Because when you're talking about the Creative Commons, I think the Creative Commons is a fabulous thing. But then, what's Microsoft's economic interest in this, and um, why are you know we're all giving something? I mean, so granted, I could go and I could find all this stuff, and I could do something really groovy with it. But Microsoft is going to go and do something that's going to make it a lot of money with it. I'm going to assume, and so. To me, that kind of abrogates the Creative Commons. So, so. That's, that, that, that's that's a really so yeah. really interesting, really interesting point of view, Kat. Thank you for giving me a hardball question. We we um we actually we so I invited Larry Lessig up to give us a talk and to and to brainstorm with us about all of this back when we were first making Photosynth in two thousand eight, um, and you know we we took a very we took a very um, aggressive stand with Photosynth. In actually making you know Creative Commons default, the default attribution, and you know, inc and encouraging people to learn about what it is, and saying, but you can copyright, you can reserve rights, and so on. And um, I will say that you know his his point of view was very much you know uh, not yours in the sense that you know he was uh, he was saying you know guys you're 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 using it exactly you're using Creative Commons exactly the way I intended Creative Commons to be used. And I mean the, the fundamental point to understand there is that. What the Creative Commons does uh, isn't really for Microsoft's benefit. If you're, for example, using Photosynth to store your photos, Microsoft has the right to show those photos in other contexts anyway, just like Flickr does. If you store photos on, on Flickr with copyright, they're copyright to you, but Flickr can show it in the context of their web page that has their own stuff on it. Uh, what Creative Commons is really about is the rights of others who are neither you nor the company that you're actually storing your stuff with to use it for further applications. So the Creative Commons stuff, in, in our view, you know, what we're trying to do is very, is only very indirectly beneficial to Microsoft with Creative Commons. We'd have those rights anyway uh, with anything that's stored on our own servers. What we're trying to do is, is, you know, really is to enable a commons so that those things can be remixed to make new experiences outside and in other kinds of applications. And the reason we're doing that is because we, we think that um, and I, this really is a philosophical point as much as it is a business point, that, that if, if your goal is not to monetize your media, then um, there is, you know, and yet it's public, there is no point, there's no benefit to anybody in reserving the copyright as, as long as your name, as long as your name is, is, is displayed when those media are used. Yes. Absolutely. Well, there are different variations on Creative Commons. There's Creative Commons share alike, which means that Hollywood could make a movie, but only if it were free. Right? Um, and there's Creative Commons attribution, which is the loosest form of Creative Commons. In that, in that case, they could make money, and all they need to do is attribute you. So the attribution is the thing that never goes away. You can force them to make it free if you make, if you make it free. It's... This is a really, uh, it's a, these are really, really interesting points. I, again, I mean, if, if you believe that what you're doing is um, economical, if you have any intention of reaping any economic benefit from it, you should copyright. You should copyright and you, and you, should, and you should enforce your copyright. And by exposing those metadata in a uniform way, one of the things that we're doing is we're making it very easy for copyrighted material to be avoided by applications that, that don't want to use copyright, you know, or, that are, or that are not allowed to use copyrighted material. So we're trying to make it very easy for the rights to be reserved, just as much as we're trying to make it easy for the stuff that is open to be used and remixed. And we believe in both of those things, right? In, in the rights of the individual to retain 
the, to retain the, you know, the, that, that, uh, that authority over their own works, as well as the, um, the ability for the commons to really be a commons. And we see our role as, as, as an enabler. Look, I, I mean, I, I don't want to get all Pollyannish. Of course, Microsoft is out to make money with this stuff, right? In the same sense that Google makes money with its, with its index of web pages. It is, and we're not making any money on this stuff yet. Uh, you know, online services division, you know, is not a money maker for Microsoft at this point <laughs> in history. Um, so of course, there's a, there's an economic end game for us in doing this. But again, I, I, I mean, I hate to keep referring to Google, but one should think about the, what Google did with indexing the web as the parallel. Um, if you're a creator of, of a blog, uh, you're happy that Google has indexed it, and um, you know that's. What enables you to, to be an, to be a player in that economic ecosystem, and we, we see this as, as precisely parallel to that. And if you don't want your stuff to be indexed by Google, you put the, the appropriate robots.txt, and you're done. Similarly, you reserve the rights, you're done. I hope that. When technology develops in such a short period of time, it's easy to forget. We're talking about two-dimensional to, to three-dimensional. There's the fourth vector of time. Time, yeah. And I've, are you looking at ways to essentially time travel in a three-dimensional space and actually see? Oh yeah. Not yeah. only what as people add more stuff. Yeah, we certainly. But also certainly as people are. put up old pictures. Yeah, let's have a look. Um, let's let's have a look. Let's see if we can find um, some of the old stuff. Uh, even in our experiment, we began playing around with some of these things. Um, if we if we get lucky, uh, we might be able to. Let's see. So the market is over here. Let's drop down um, near Pike Place Market, where we, we had a, we had a bunch of um, a bunch of historic media that we put up here. Um, let's see. Oh, oops. Let's close that. Let's open the street side photo. So now, now I get to show off one of the things that I wanted to show off before, but we didn't have we didn't have good connectivity. Uh, these are so you see that thing in the middle. That's a Flickr photo overlaid on top of the street side. So this is uh, you know this now you s now you see it now you don't right. So you, you can see the the connection, and of course this sign has changed right. So this is, this this is a very mild form of time of time travel. Here it says officially licensed blah blah blah, and here it says something for ten dollars two for ten dollars. Um, but but more interestingly, here is um, here is a photo of um, Pike Place Market, if we can if we can get it, that just barely matched from uh, from the Seattle Municipal Archives. Actually, it's, now there we go. Right, this is from this is from just after the turn of the century, and there's just enough material in common between this photo and the and the street side imagery to form a match. So. Yeah, the, the the temporal aspect is is wonderful and is really is really interesting, and um, if you have enough things that you've captured along the way to form a continuous chain, so that there's there are enough features that connect across time, you can do things like time sliders and so on. So we're we're very interested in in user experiences that 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 generate that sort of time travel. Imagine a you know a magnifying glass you could hold up and it would have a little slider on the side that would let you move back in time. Right? Yeah, of course there were so few media back then. When you look at the volumes, they're just growing and growing and growing exponentially. But what that means is that now, when we think about the about the future history of these kinds of media, the things that we're capturing now and the way these environments will change over the coming years and decades, it will be documented so thoroughly that you really will almost literally be able to do things like just like that, right? Time travel with the with the lens that you put in front of your eye. Could you share some real-world use cases uh, of this apart from, say, fun? Nah. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's, um, you know, on honestly, that question uh, makes me think a little bit of um, in the 1980s when um, people were asking, so, you know, these, like, these hobbyist personal computers, you know, what are they good for besides, you know, storing your recipes? Or, you know, why do we need multitasking, you know, if you're not, um, 
you know, it's, it's one of these things that I think is, is going to become so much a fabric of our senses and our reality in, say, 10 years' time that it'll be like this cell phone. You can't imagine what it's like to live outside of this tapestry. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm actually not going to answer the question directly. I, I I'll just say this. Um, think about what, what's happening with our cell phones especially as being like um, bionics. They're, they're augmentations of what we are as humans. So, uh, you know, the, the, the first capabilities that come to us from the, from the cell phone is, of course, just the ability to break down the barriers in space between me and another person and to communicate uh, wherever that person is and wherever I am. And um, if one thinks about the ability to break down barriers between people, break down barriers in time, break down barriers between yourself and the information that is connected to a place or to a moment, uh, I, I mean, it's the number of possibilities is so overwhelming. I, I think I'd be doing us all a disservice to try and start, you know, cataloging where you know, there's like the best hamburger app and all this kind of stuff. You know, it's it's just it's it's much deeper than that. It's really about augmenting our own capabilities as humans. Um, so lots, lots of lots of things beyond just fun. Um. So I'm. I'm interested in how we might be able to use this sort of technology for searching. Um, yeah. Like today I can type in the name of a person and come up with a picture of their face. Would it be possible to take a picture of someone's face and find and out get who back they the name are? Of the person. That's right. Yeah, there are a lot of different kinds of searches that you can do from an image that you can't do easily from text. And, uh, you know, I mean, the easiest one, of course, is, you know, things like buildings, which, you know, we already, you know, we know how to do that really well, right? You don't know that what you would type in to ask about that. A person's face, a building, a place, it's not really a textual thing, right? It's maybe a spatial thing, maybe a temporal thing. So being able to use those as the inputs of searches, I mean, that's one of the, one of the low-hanging fruits, if you like, of the, those applications. But again, I, I see that as really just the tip of the iceberg. When you connect all of those things together, that's, you know, that's sort of one of the immediate applications that falls out by analog with some of the applications we have today using textual search. Uh, one of the things about having this, like your iPhone app, which I don't know exactly what it does, but it opens the possibility of uh, your mobile device actually informing you that the network is kind of thin in this area and it would be nice if you'd take some pictures. That's exactly right. So showing a kind of coverage map of what's in a place and where it's thin and where it's thick is really interesting. So this is a video of, um, this is a kind of promotional video that we shot a couple of weeks ago of that app. So it gives you a bit of a sense of what it does. You move it around and you see how it's kind of tracking. Uh, it's not fully 3D, it's still, it's still um, kind of 2D-ish. But as you move it, it's snapping together those photos to create a panorama. What's, what's interesting about that is that it's really just about overcoming this fundamental limitation of the way one thinks about the camera on a, on a phone. They're designed for snapping pictures of people at parties, really, right? And they have a very narrow field of view. When you think about your eyeballs and how they work, you know, I, I see all of you, you know, I see almost half a sphere worth of visual information here, and the phone sees this. If you work in real estate, you know, the way Marlo does, right, you know what a problem it is to try and capture something that's not a face but an environment or a scene using a camera. It's just a nightmare. And so the, the simple thing that we did here is just, you know, we you can capture one of these kind of environments, you know, full 360, the entire sphere, just by rotating your phone around. It snaps, snap, snap, it snaps automatically. And it fuses these things and it publishes them. So you create artifacts that are just like the street side bubbles, but with your, with your phone, that's what it does. What I was thinking more of was in the, in the global trellis, like if you were at Angkor Wat or wherever, yeah. that you would be informed that for the global global map, it would be useful for you to contribute something from this yes. area. Yeah, yeah, I, I, of course. So it's, um, you know, if we, if we go back to this mapping thing, and uh, let's see, where is, okay, we were doing this over here. If we, um, 
exit street side and move up and look at oh now we've lost our um now we've lost our internet again nuts um when when we click on the human scale button today in in Bing Maps Explorer, um, and you know when there's internet, <laughs> then you you not only see blue casings around the roads that we've driven, ah here we go, but you also so there the, there's the blue casing coming in slowly slowly slowly, you also see uh, little green dots where people have made since, and so you, we have just the beginnings now of that sort of sense of density of trellis on the map. Uh, of course, it c that can get a whole lot richer when you're thinking about that inner augmented reality kind of sense, right, through the viewfinder of the camera. So you can see a lot of little, d a lot of little zits right around Pike's around Pike Place Market where lots of people take sins and, and, and pictures over there. But that that kind of heat map of coverage or of where things differ, where things have changed, and kind of change detectors is another interesting thing, right? I'm here in this spot. Actually, the military is very interested in these sorts of things for, right, as you can imagine, if you're looking for IEDs, you know, and something has been concealed, right, it would be really interesting to have a lens that just shows you, you know, this is the environment as it was last week, and things are hot where something is different than it was last week. Again, very simple kind of application and, and relatively easy to do using that, using that kind of um, trellis and heat map type idea. Blaze, um, when I think about the fact that we all know about how easy it is to fake a photo in Photoshop, yeah. I'm wondering, like, why can't, uh, as a CGI artist, why can't you take the points and corners of um, Notre Dame Cathedral, and zoom into the window, and go through the window, and see the hunchback taking a shower inside? In other words, my question is, how many people have, how many artists have actually hacked the the photosynth methodology yes. in a public forum to create a an Easter egg. If we've it we've seen we've seen some we've seen some interesting Easter eggs along those lines, and it's very very doable. And I imagine, and of course, there's a light side to that, which is you know making art that does interesting things. I, one of one of my favorite concepts around this kind of stuff is the idea of making wormholes. You know, we we all dream of being able to step through pictures, right? And if you think about uh, a room that has pictures of many places in the world, this was kind of my Narnia, you know, kind of vision, right? That you have pictures of many places in the world, and suddenly those pictures become hyperlinks, and I can dive through any of them. And this is a nexus. It's a place that connects many places in the world via wormholes, right? And that's actually, not only is that easy to do, that actually happens automatically using this, using this stuff. Um, and, of course, you can do more sophisticated things, too, uh, that involve all kinds of playing of games. So the light side is art and, you know, magical wormholes and rooms that connect you to many spots in the earth, like a kind of octopus. The dark side of that is spam. And uh, I, I have no doubt that just like any technology that's about uh, indexing information, there's going to there's going to be spam, and we'll have to deal with it, and there'll be a war, you know, where both sides escalate. You know, one side keeps getting smarter, and the other side tries to. It'll happen. Thank you. Um, so with the Connect, we saw the first commercial introduction of an RGBB camera um, to mainstream use. So. Uh, now a lot of people are thinking about putting the same kind of camera on cell phones and at laptops, um, tuned for different purposes for capturing human faces for buildings and things like that. Um, in terms of blending that technology with Photosynth, uh, what potential do you see in terms of enhancing user experience and improving Photosynth, things like that? Huge. Yeah, so, so uh, you, you say RGBD, so th the translation of that is you have a red and green and blue channel in the image, but you also have a depth channel. Right, so you know how far away every pixel was. Um, of course, we do that too, but our technique for doing that in our brains uses stereo, meaning you know, your, your, the disparity, the optical disparity between the two eyes is what creates the depth channel for us, uh, at least for, I don't know, three quarters of us, because it, it turns out that a substantial number of people don't have uh, depth perception for one reason or another. But um, these other techniques that use time of flight or that use uh, some kind of range sensing to create that without stereo are really interesting too. You know, it's all additional information. There, there have been lots, at the last uh, Consumer Electronics Show, there were multiple cameras with two lenses on them, right? So we start to see stereo coming up as a, as a, as a common photography technique. If, if I had to guess, I would say that in 10 years' time, uh, a camera with only one lens will be 
um, a rarity. You know, most cameras will have at least two lenses coming out the front in order to get depth, if not more sophisticated rangefinder techniques. And of course, those add, you know, those add to the potential of things like this. But of course, you get you get something 3D from the beginning. This is back to the military question. So, do you think that I know I shouldn't, I know I shouldn't have done that with you in the audience? <laughs> do you think the CIA <laughs> used this? to figure out how to attack Osama bin Laden's compound? Oh, man. I mean, I that's no one idea. way of asking that question. But I have no idea what the CIA did with, with to find bin Laden. I, I, know that, um, I know that the government is very interested in these sorts of techniques. And um, so far, I've managed to avoid working with DARPA you know, on this stuff. Um, and I, beyond that, I, I'm not, I, I don't think I have anything smart to say about it. I mean. Of course they're interested, but I, I think that, you know, my honest, my honest feeling, they're not ahead of us. No, I, I mean, I think it's a, little, it's a little bit like business versus consumer. You know, it used to be that businesses had more sophisticated technology than consumers did, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And we've seen an, an interesting inversion in which suddenly, you know, people on the street have better stuff than, the, you know, than businesses do, right? And, and businesses are kind of struggling to catch up. Oh, maybe we should, you know, tweet, you know, or something. <laughs> and I actually think the military is in a similar situation. I mean, the, the, the era of very sophisticated government programs for, uh, you know, doing stuff like this and that being just way ahead, I, I don't really think that's so true anymore. Uh, that's, uh, again, that's just a guess. I'm not, I'm not saying that with any very special knowledge. But. Yes, that's true. Yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. It, it's enabling for everybody, and and that's that's all. That this also gets into a philosophical point. I mean, I think that, given that these things are possible to do, I would rather make them possible for everybody. And yeah, you know, given that 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 advances anyway, let's let's democratize. I'm curious how the technology is able to tell between similar but different objects. Uh, so you talked about the wormholes before where there's a, a, a painting on your wall or a, a, a photograph um, that you know, is, a, is a point in time representation of a real place in the world. And you can, you can dive into that assuming there's a synth created of it. Um, is that something that, that the algorithm wants to keep going forward or does it want to be able to distinguish between, say, the Statue of Liberty in New York and the Statue of Liberty on the New York, New York Hotel in Las Vegas? Well, using vision alone, you often can't distinguish between those things. And one of the, one of the things that, in fact, makes those vision algorithms work is their robustness. And what robustness means in this context is that, I'm sorry, this was the image I was looking for. These are those images of Notre Dame. And notice that um, this is going to be a little bit small and hard to see, but um, you know, some of these have people occluding large parts of the structure. Those people don't end up in the synth be because their features aren't reproduced in any of the other photos. But that's okay because there are enough features in the cathedral behind them that that photo gets locked anyway. Uh, and there are a couple of these that are even posters of Notre Dame Cathedral, and you know they just end up in the synth too. And you know that's like the wormhole thing happening automatically. Um, so th the algorithms are designed to make that just work automatically. And, um, you know, it really relies on the application to figure out whether those things ought to connect, how they should connect, how the user experience should work, and so on. The way Photosynth works, and I'm not happy, by the way, with the way Photosynth works in terms of navigating spaces. I think it was an early attempt that you know, will we'll do much better in the future. But the way Photosynth works is just that, uh, you know, there's a 3D model behind it, and you move from photo to photo and you transition. You make a kind of s as smooth a transition as you can from photo to photo. If one of them was a poster and one of them was the real thing, it doesn't care. Uh, that's a, n a pretty naive approach. And the how to make a user experience that distinguishes between those things and makes, um, you know, makes hay out of that in some way, I'm not really sure yet. I think it's a really interesting area for work. Wow, I'm really getting a buzz off of this. The shoot stuff is <laughs> strong. <laughs> So early on, and the, I think it was the first question, somebody was asking about the LIDAR, and you were yeah. talking about the LIDAR. 
and how you were talking about this technique is effectively replacing the LIDAR. It's not necessary anymore. Then there's another question about the Connect, where it, it has a LIDAR kind of component to it. Yeah. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, um, at, at one point it was like, well, you don't need the LIDAR anymore. But then it's like, well, with the LIDAR, it opens up a whole realm of capabilities. And so yeah. what I'm wondering is, uh, where does the, the stereoscopic vision break down where the LIDAR it enables it or helps it to get better? And at what point can stereoscopic vision replace a LIDAR? Like, I think of motion capture technology for videos, for films, and that kind of stuff. Can they just get rid of that kind of expensive and just put a bunch of iPhones in there to do all their expensive movie productions type of stuff? Yeah, no, this is a great question. So I, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have um, spoken so rashly <laughs> about LIDAR in the sense that um, I mean, th the place where I think LIDAR really has been supplanted and what I was talking about really was surveying and aerial imagery. But the thing about aerial imagery is that you have, um, you know, you can, f you can fly a very expensive camera at very high resolution and just snap, 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 snap. You know, the, 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 uh, the data rates that you can create and the overlaps that you can create and so on mean that you can get super dense stereo clouds from repeated snapping of photos in, an auto in a plane as you fly. Um, and also, of course, when you look at those aerial images, there are aerial images in almost all places on Earth, other than maybe some deserts and over the sea, by the way. Um, they're very rich in points. They're very rich in features. Um, that's not true of, uh, of certain indoor scenes. And uh, in fact, the photosynth app suffers from this a little bit. If you have a blank wall, you know, LiDAR bounces off of that and creates a 3D reconstruction just fine. But if it, if it really is a white wall, there are no features there. And any kind of vision-based reconstruction of 3D just doesn't work. Uh, also on things that are soft and squishy and that deform, like bodies, um, right? <laughs> if, they're not too, if they're not too freckly or tattooy, right? They don't work so well either with, uh, with stereo. So I mean, for those reasons, I mean, Connect is, of course, designed specifically for bodies and specifically for indoor environments. And specifically to work at video rates on, on low, you know, on with, without excessive compute, because you're supposed to be using a compute on other stuff, like playing the game. So it's a it's a great technology for that application. And I don't think that you know one just kills the other anytime in the near future. I do think lidar has been killed for land surveying, uh, pretty much. But I don't think it's been killed for a lot of these kind of indoor applications, and especially when these range sensing cameras, I mean, the Connect is not LiDAR, strictly speaking. It's a different range, range sensing technology. And when those things are just as cheap as the kind of CMOS, you know, CCD sensor type things, then it's just another channel. You know, of course, you know, throw it in. Why not, right? And use it whenever you can. And, you know, when, when the processing power gets super cheap, which, it's, which is happening too, throw in stereo too and use that when you can. Put in two range sensors, what the hell, you know, and put in, uh, do stereo and LiDAR. Um, I mean, th these things are all, because the costs are, are dropping the way they are, I, I see all of these things happening at the same time. Time for one or two more questions. Do you have pictures of like Mount Rainier and, and uh, wildlife photos and things in nature and like do you track like glacier melt or things like that? That's a really interesting question. We, we um, I mean there are, if you search on photosynth.net for Mount Rainier or, or for Glacier or whatever, you'll find stuff. Um, but as far as the kind of longitudinal tracking of a thing over time, you really need environments like, uh, for the time being at least, you need environments like Pike Place Market where so many people have gone and photographed for so long that you, you really could put a time slider on there. We, we don't have anything like the density of data around glaciers where you could imagine a time slider with the, with the data we have today. On the other hand, if Read Write World does what I hope it will, then you know webcams and things will start to go up that that'll that'll be taking photos all the time of glaciers, and you will be able to do the time slider thing. And that, and of course, you could do that even without Read Write World. You could do it just by taking a photo at a given time of day and just sliding the thing. But the robustness of being being able to move the camera or whatever and still have all of that knit together is is the advantage. I suppose what we're going for. One more? If there's one last question, we can take it. I've got one slip left, so. <laughs> no? 
All right, we'll go ahead and end there. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you.